Until the mid-1970s, the majority of the world had never heard the word cocaine. There simply wasn't a demand for its mass production, distribution, and consumption. However, this soon changed drastically. Suddenly, everyone knew about cocaine. It had the power to make you feel incredible, keeping you awake for days and making you feel like a superhero. But this pleasure came at a high cost, and many found it lucrative to sell cocaine. One of the most infamous figures during this era was Pablo Escobar. However, there was another individual who worked closely not only with Escobar, but also with many other cocaine suppliers. This man was the pioneer in using airplanes for drug transportation and was a partner to the renowned drug lord Carlos Leder. This character was George Jung, who gained fame through the movie Blow, released in 2001. Johnny Depp portrayed him exceptionally well in the film, which, while not a blockbuster, garnered a substantial following, with many feeling deeply engaged in his story. George Jacob Jung was born on August 6, 1942, in Boston, Massachusetts. His family later moved to Weymouth, Massachusetts, where his father ran a business. Financial struggles were a constant for his father, but the family managed to have the essentials. Even as a child, George decided he wouldn't accept poverty. Although not the best student, he excelled at football and exhibited true leadership qualities on and off the field. While George was a relatively normal guy and not a troublemaker, his first encounter with prison happened when he was still quite young. This marked the beginning of a journey that would eventually lead him into the dangerous world of drug trafficking. In high school, George Jung's first brush with the law occurred when he was arrested for soliciting a prostitute who turned out to be an undercover agent. This marked the beginning of multiple encounters with the legal system. Nevertheless, he managed to graduate from high school and enrolled at the University of Southern Mississippi with plans to pursue a degree in advertising. Unfortunately, he couldn't complete his studies as he soon found himself immersed in something that would determine his destiny, marijuana. George and a friend moved to Manhattan Beach, California in search of a better life. The sun, the beaches, the beautiful girls, and a vibrant and liberating atmosphere awaited them. However, to fully enjoy everything, they needed a significant amount of money. Given their love for marijuana, selling it seemed like a viable option. The friends organized a party where marijuana was abundant, and it didn't take long for someone to inquire about purchasing it. A friend was impressed by the quality and asked about the cost. Discovering that it could be bought for a fraction of the price on the East Coast, he saw a business opportunity. The challenge, however, was transporting it hundreds of miles without losing money in the process. George's girlfriend, who was a flight attendant, provided a solution. The marijuana was transported successfully, sold quickly, and the net profit per kilogram was substantial. This venture proved to be a tremendous success, setting the stage for what would become a highly profitable and notorious career for George Jung. The path to wealth and danger was now paved, and the next chapter of his life would be defined by the burgeoning world of drug trafficking. The foundation had to be laid, and the East Coast market for marijuana proved to be truly insatiable. Supplies started to increase steadily, gradually transforming it into a lucrative business. George Jung became a well-known marijuana trafficker on the East Coast, sourcing his product from intermediaries in California who set their own prices and rules. Recognizing the need to eliminate middlemen, he decided to work directly with the source. To achieve this, George traveled to Mexico, despite not knowing a word of Spanish or anything about the country. His lack of language skills and unfamiliarity with Mexico posed significant challenges. George and his friends spent two weeks there but couldn't achieve their objectives. His lack of Spanish proficiency became a hindrance. Eventually, realizing their approach wasn't working, the friends contemplated returning home. In a stroke of luck on their last day, they met an American hippie girl who agreed to give them a ride back. Little did they know that this girl behind the wheel of a yellow Volkswagen Beetle would be their savior. During their conversation, the girl mentioned living with a Mexican guy who had what George needed. In the next turn of events, they met this guy who turned out to be the son of a Mexican general. While a bit eccentric, he had what George required. He sold large quantities of marijuana to George at $1.20 per kilogram. In California, 
George was purchasing marijuana for $1.06 per kilogram through intermediaries. The deal was a resounding success, leaving only the transportation of marijuana to the United States. An airplane was employed for this purpose, marking the beginning of George's venture into the world of drug trafficking. Being an addict himself, George was now deeply entwined in the dangerous and lucrative trade that would soon propel him into notoriety. Fueled by adrenaline, George Jung made the daring decision to pilot his first flight himself, despite having minimal flying experience. As expected, the flight proved challenging, and George's lack of experience nearly jeopardized the entire transportation operation and, more importantly, his life. Lost over the Pacific Ocean, approximately 100 miles off course and with darkness setting in, the situation became terrifying. In a stroke of luck, George spotted a mountain pass to the east, which became a crucial reference point and a means of escape. After some time, the plane safely reached its destination, but the harrowing experience led George to vow never to transport loads in a plane without professional pilots. Following this, George and his friends rented a beachfront villa in Puerto Vallarta, earning approximately $50,000 to $100,000 per month. Typically making two trips a month, they not only delivered marijuana by plane to California, but also embarked on a three-day drive eastward to Amherst. While the business was labor-intensive, the young and ambitious group embraced the challenge with no complaints. However, in 1974, the thriving enterprise came to an abrupt end. George was arrested in Chicago with 600 pounds of marijuana. The buyer, who happened to be associated with the heroin trade, disclosed George's name to mitigate his own sentence. Surprisingly, federal agents expressed reluctance to arrest him, stating they didn't wish to apprehend marijuana dealers. Nevertheless, since this case was linked to a heroin operation, they had no choice. George was convicted and sent to a federal prison. This marked a turning point in his tumultuous journey through the world of drug trafficking. In prison, George Jung encountered a man who would alter the course of his life forever. This man was Carlos Letta, a Colombian with a refined demeanor, good English, and a plan to make millions of dollars. Carlos, formerly imprisoned for car theft, was not truly interested in cars. Rather, he was developing an ambitious scheme involving cocaine. While in prison, Carlos sought a way to smuggle cocaine out of Colombia and find individuals to distribute it in the United States. George, an experienced contrabandist with significant expertise in transporting marijuana, became Carlos's ideal partner. Destiny brought them together in the same cell, and George, who didn't consider marijuana trafficking morally wrong, was about to be introduced to a completely different world of drugs. George had convinced himself that he was merely satisfying a demand that young people had, and while he knew he was breaking the law, he believed the law was morally misguided. His perspective shifted when it came to heroin, which he viewed as a substance he would never transport. However, Carlos spoke of an entirely different drug cocaine. At the time, very few people knew much about cocaine in the United States. It was scarce, and its remarkable effects were largely unknown. The market for cocaine was untapped, presenting a potentially wild opportunity. Initially reluctant to involve himself with cocaine, George's perspective changed dramatically when he learned about the staggering profits involved. Carlos informed him that in Colombia, a kilogram of cocaine cost $4,000 to $5,000, while in the United States it could be sold for $6,000. The numbers left George astounded, realizing he could earn several times more with this drug. This revelation marked the beginning of George Jung's involvement in the cocaine trade, setting the stage for a new and dangerous chapter in his tumultuous journey. After amassing substantial wealth through the successful transportation of cocaine via suitcases, George Jung and Carlos Leder were released from prison in 1975. Following their agreement, Carlos, upon reaching Colombia, would send a telegram to George's parents' house, signaling the next phase of their operation. Their plan involved George recruiting two unsuspecting young women to transport cocaine in their suitcases from Antigua to the United States. George spent several days finding two naive girls who were open to the idea of having some fun in Antigua and had no qualms about unknowingly carrying drugs in their luggage. 
These women were oblivious to the nature of the substance they were transporting. The initial operation proved successful, prompting the duo to contemplate expanding their business. To do so, they needed an aircraft, as relying on suitcases and baggage had limitations and increased the risk of detection. An airplane would significantly streamline their transportation methods and exponentially boost their profits. George and Carlos acquired an airplane and hired a professional pilot to facilitate their operations. The Bahamas became their loading station, allowing for more efficient transfers. Transporting cocaine by plane to the United States proved to be a lucrative and relatively uncomplicated endeavor. The partners quickly realized the potential and started increasing the frequency of their flights. Despite already making millions, the insatiable appetite for more money drove them to continue expanding their operations. The increasing number of flights and the strategic use of airplanes established George and Carlos as major players in the cocaine trade, setting the stage for even greater challenges and consequences in their tumultuous journey. As George Jung continued his involvement in the cocaine trade, fate led him to encounter a man who would become the most infamous drug lord in history, Pablo Escobar. Colombian drug traffickers were astounded by the shrewdness with which Carlos Leder and George Young transported and sold drugs in the United States. Carlos and George's efficiency caught the attention of Colombian traffickers, who were facing challenges in smuggling large quantities of cocaine into the United States. George, with his expertise, was entrusted with eliminating these complications. The arrangements were swiftly made, and the partnership began shipping substantial amounts of drugs from Colombia to the United States. This operation became the backbone of the notorious Medellin cartel. By the late 1970s, George and Carlos were instrumental in supplying around 80% of all cocaine in the United States. Their modus operandi involved Friday night flights from the Bahamas to Pablo Escobar's estate in Colombia, staying overnight and returning on Saturday to blend in with northbound air traffic. The planes, undetected for a while, descended below radar detection and landed in North America. By the end of the 1970s, the cartel had established a stronghold in the cocaine market. Thanks to George's connections and his fleet of planes, money flowed in abundance. During this era, the consumption of cocaine became normalized, much like marijuana. The United States inadvertently allowed the media, recording, and film industries to promote cocaine use. The government, unaware, indirectly contributed to the acceptance of cocaine. Consuming cocaine was considered fashionable, especially among those with high incomes. The government's lack of awareness and the media's unintentional promotion led to a cultural shift where cocaine was perceived as a fantastic and miraculous drug. It provided an enormous energy boost, allowing individuals to stay awake for days. The public, unbeknownst to the negative consequences, embraced the drug, marking a significant chapter in the history of drug culture. The cocaine trade, once perceived as a glamorous and euphoric venture, gradually revealed its malevolent nature. As the drug spread its influence across the United States, its supply continued to grow exponentially. More individuals became entangled in the cocaine business, and among them was Boston George, also known as George Jung. George's association with Carlos Leder, initially prosperous, took a downturn. Carlos, an admirer of John Lennon and Adolf Hitler simultaneously, exhibited signs of unreliability. Although everything seemed fine initially, as Carlos amassed tens of millions of dollars, the allure of wealth and unrestricted access clouded his judgment. Carlos, now fueled by immense wealth, made extravagant purchases, including a small island named Norman's Cay for $4.5 million. He acquired small single-engine airplanes worth $5 million each, which proved inadequate for transporting cargo from Colombia without refueling. Thus, a transshipment base was needed, and Norman's K was conveniently located 340 kilometers off the coast of Florida, facilitating a considerable increase in cocaine supply. The money became abundant, and Carlos, driven by greed, forcibly expelled all residents from Norman's K. Some left in exchange for money, while others met tragic ends. George, however, questioned the wisdom of purchasing the island, considering it an erroneous move. He believed in the mantra of staying mobile to avoid capture. George's concern grew as Carlos entertained increasingly erratic ideas. 
Carlos contemplated seizing control of Belize, a move that deeply troubled George. Witnessing Carlos saving money by hiring inexpensive and inexperienced pilots further heightened George's apprehensions. The once cohesive partnership between George Jung and Carlos Leder began to unravel, signaling a turbulent chapter in their criminal enterprise. As the cocaine trade evolved, so did the challenges and internal conflicts, setting the stage for the eventual downfall of their illicit empire. Norman's K, a tranquil island that served as the primary conduit for Colombian cocaine into the United States over four years, was descending into madness. Once an efficient operation, it became a lawless domain where Carlos Leta, fueled by the influence of cocaine, entrusted dubious associates with significant responsibilities. His escalating trust in unreliable confidants, coupled with the constant risk of being swindled, played a pivotal role in the dissolution of the partnership between George Jung and Carlos Leda. George, now widely known as Boston George in the world of narcotics, maintained close communication with Pablo Escobar. This newfound proximity to major Colombian drug lords allowed him to secure independent supplies and continue shipping cocaine to the United States, albeit without his former associate Carlos. Working directly with Escobar proved to be as tumultuous as his previous partnership with Leda. During a visit to Medellin, George witnessed the ruthless nature of Escobar firsthand. In a chilling incident, Escobar executed a man right in front of George during a meeting in the patio. Two bodyguards took an informant to the estate, and shortly afterward, the man was executed. Pablo nonchalantly apologized to George, returned to the table, and casually asked about dinner preferences, as if nothing had occurred. Escobar's ability to switch between brutality and normalcy left an indelible mark on George, showcasing the ruthlessness required in the drug trade. George's interactions with Escobar, marked by tension and violence, offered a glimpse into the perilous world of drug trafficking. Escobar deliberately orchestrated such confrontations to demonstrate the consequences of betrayal. The chilling execution served as a stark reminder of the risks and dangers inherent in this clandestine realm. As Boston George navigated this treacherous path, his journey became increasingly entwined with the volatile dynamics of the drug trade, setting the stage for further twists and turns in his criminal odyssey. George Young grappled with the realization that he would never betray Pablo Escobar. He also came to understand the stark differences between the cocaine and marijuana businesses. The marijuana trade relied on trust and handshakes, while the cocaine business operated with a constant backdrop of danger, where guns were as integral as deals. George, despite his aversion to violence, was ensnared in this perilous world by his affinity for risk. By 1987, George had amassed $100 million and minimized his tax liabilities through a Panamanian account. Living in a luxurious Massachusetts mansion, he indulged in a life of opulence, attending celebrity parties, socializing with beautiful women, and owning top-tier automobiles. His prominence in the cocaine world made him a shining star, but it also drew the attention of authorities. Surveillance on his house became routine, signaling that it was only a matter of time before Boston George found himself back behind bars. In 1987, law enforcement raided George's house, anticipating finding substantial amounts of cocaine. However, the discovery was meager only three or four ounces. Despite this, it was enough for an arrest. Facing the prospect of reduced prison time, George was offered a deal to testify against his former partner, Carlos Leder. Recalling Escobar's brutal treatment of informants, George initially resisted but eventually agreed. Carlos Leder was arrested and extradited to the United States. While in custody, Carlos decided to cooperate fully, providing all possible information about the Medellin cartel. George, initially hesitant, eventually joined him in testifying. This decision was not solely George's. Pressure from Pablo Escobar, who sought retribution for Carlos's betrayal, played a significant role. Carlos Leda, once George's betrayer, was now paying the price. He received a life sentence, marking the end of his criminal career. For George Young, the prison sentence was not the end of the story. In a surprising turn of events, he was soon released. Life seemed not to have taught George any profound lessons as he quickly returned to his old ways. 
Driven more by a thirst for adventure than financial gain, he resurrected his old smuggling business in 1994. Reconnecting with a pilot from his marijuana trafficking days, George attempted to revive the glory of the past. The pilot, a friend from the 60s, willingly dove back into the illicit trade. However, their reunion faced complications, revealing that the allure of the criminal underworld still held a grip on George Young. The subsequent events unfolded in a manner that would once again intertwine George with the ever-dangerous realm of drug trafficking. Boston George's saga took an unexpected turn when an operation orchestrated by the Drug Enforcement Administration, DEA, unfolded like a movie script. A meticulously executed cocaine smuggling operation ended with another incarceration for Boston George. In this case, he found himself as an unwitting pawn in a premeditated move by authorities. The once revered figure became the ugly duckling, as law enforcement sought to capture a bigger fish. The authorities needed to apprehend a significant player, and George unwittingly became a tool to trap the real culprit. Despite his long history of drug trafficking, often escaping with minimal prison time, this time was different. In 1994, George was caught red-handed, smuggling a substantial 1754 pounds of cocaine in a stolen plane. This marked a pivotal moment in his life. Facing the prospect of spending the rest of his days behind bars, George Jung, the former high-flying drug trafficker, reflected on his choices. Before his sentencing, he spoke candidly with the judge, who expressed astonishment. George was asked why, with $100 million in anonymity, he hadn't walked away. The response was a testament to George's love for risk, adventure, and the vibrant, free-spirited life he had embraced. While George initially entered the drug trade for financial gain, he had transcended mere monetary motivations. His desire for a thrilling lifestyle had become an addiction, surpassing any attachment to wealth. The consequences of his actions caught up with him as he faced a severe sentence, 60 years in prison. At 54, it seemed like a lifetime sentence. However, George's story took a surprising twist. His sentence was eventually reduced due to good behavior. After serving 20 years, he was released on June 2, 2014. Despite his daughter never visiting him in prison, they seemingly managed to build a relationship after his release. Boston George's life story stands out for its twists and turns, illustrating the complex interplay of risk, addiction, and the pursuit of a unique and unrestrained existence. George Jung's life, both brilliant and not as bleak as one might expect given his involvement in illicit activities, reflects a journey marked by resilience and unexpected turns. Despite facing prison sentences twice before the age of 54, George experienced relatively minor convictions both times. What sets his narrative apart is that he didn't have to endure the loss of loved ones, escape gunfire, or spend his entire youth behind bars. In a remarkable twist, George Jung managed to avoid the fate of many other notorious drug traffickers. His life story, portrayed in the film Blow, catapulted him into the spotlight. The movie chronicles Jung's role in the cocaine boom in the United States during the 1970s and early 1980s, Despite being a key player in the drug trade, George enjoyed a surprisingly comfortable and risk-laden life compared to his counterparts. The film's depiction of George Jung's life paints a picture of a man who, while deeply entwined in the drug trade, managed to lead a relatively good life. However, the question arises, why was he not content with his seemingly satisfying existence? The answer lies in one of his interviews, where he philosophically stated, we live and die alone. Despite spending two decades in prison and a few more incarcerated here and there, George cherished the numerous wonderful experiences he had during his moments of freedom. In reflecting on his tumultuous life, George Jung expressed a sentiment that encapsulates his unique perspective. I've had so many wonderful experiences in my life of living in total freedom that I wouldn't change it for all the gold in the world. His narrative serves as a testament to the complexities of a life marked by risk, choices, and the pursuit of a distinct form of liberty. George Jung passed away on May 5, 2021, at the age of 78. His life, filled with highs and lows, leaves behind a legacy that transcends the confines of his notorious involvement in the drug trade.